Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core. It's been a while since I reviewed a mini PC, and it's been even longer since I reviewed an Intel one, and that's what we're going to do here today. Today we're going to have a look at the new Minis Forum NAD9. Now this is the first mini PC that I've seen with this new design here from Minis Forum, and I really like the look of it. To start, it has ventilation everywhere. In fact, the whole thing basically is covered in mesh. And so that means that not only will it be well ventilated, but you can actually get a pretty good look inside the mini PC at any angle as well. Additionally, I like the boxy look of it. It just looks like a smaller version of a tower PC, and it's got a good amount of I.O. as well. It has all the ports I would like on the front here, but then also on the back, we've got basically everything I would be looking for as well. We'll go over these each specifically here in a second. But first I want to talk about price so that way we can get an idea of what we're going to expect out of this machine. And the starting price here is $599 for the bare bones version. That means it's not going to come with a hard drive or RAM. And that'll be a nice option if you already have those components lying around so you can save a little bit of money. However, the unit we're testing here today did come preloaded with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And the going price for those specs is going to be $709. So that's what we're looking at right here. In terms of CPU, we're looking at a 12th generation Intel Core i9 12900H. And this is my first time using this chip, but I'm pretty excited about the number of cores here. We have 14 cores and 20 threads within. Additionally, this is going to be using the integrated Intel Iris Xe graphics. Now, honestly, I've never been super impressed by integrated graphics on an Intel chipset, and so we'll see if the large number of cores and threads can offset the GPU power here. Now, going over to the I.O., looking at the back here, we do have a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, and the back also has two different USB-C ports that are capable of DisplayPort out. And if you combine that with the two HDMI ports, that means we have a quad monitor set up like this with a 4 4K 60Hz output. Continuing on the back here, we have four different USB Type-A ports. Two are USB 3.2 Gen 1 and the other are 2.0. And then finally we have our power port here connected to a 120 watt power supply. Now on the front we have a good variety when it comes to the ports. I always like having USB-A and USB-C and they are both represented here. Additionally we have a headphone jack, microphone jack, and then the ability to clear your CMOS or BIOS in case you mess up the settings. Overall, when it comes to I.O., I think we've got a pretty good setup here. Now you could just use the mini PC on its own if you wanted to just kind of have it on its side, but it also comes with a stand, and so let's connect that right here. It's pretty easy, just four screws here on the bottom. And then this is what it looks like here. And I gotta say, this is a pretty sleek look right here. As I'll show you in a minute, some of the other Minis Forum models that are vertically oriented like this have a little bit of a like gamery vibe to them, but I like this one a little bit more. To me, it just looks like a smaller version of a desktop tower, and I think I really like that look. Now, getting inside of the mini PC is very easy too. You just remove two screws and then slide the cover off. And with the magic of television here, let's get a closer look. Now, despite being a very open air architecture here, some of the components are a little bit harder to get to. For example, back here is the M.2 drive for the SSD. And so it's kind of hidden behind this controller board here for the front IO. And this is also where the Wi-Fi antennas are glued as well. And so rather than risk getting any of these messed up, I'm just gonna leave the solid state drive in here, but this is where it is. Another interesting thing is there's a lot of space here on the left side. As you can see, there's some sort of connector here at the top. And we also have a couple brackets here to secure something in place. And I think this in combination with the pins on the bottom left here are an indication to me that they're going to use this design for other mini PCs in the future. In fact, this space right here looks like it could be a good place for a small form factor graphics card in the future. Anyway, moving along here, here's a look at the RAM, which is pretty easy to access compared to the M.2 drive, and it is dual channel 8 gigabytes each. And really, other than that, we have this large heatsink with the three copper pipes right here, as well as the CPU cooling fan. Now on the other side, we don't have a lot going on other than slots for two different two and a half inch drives. And they already have the SATA connections already plugged up. So all you'd have to do is just take your two different two and a half inch drives and then connect them right here. And so I do like the fact that there's a lot of room for storage right here. In addition to upgrading the M.2 slot, you could also add just two additional drives right here. Anyway, that's really about it when it comes to the internals. It's a pretty simple setup. Now let's talk a little bit about sizing and I'm gonna use my 26 inch monitor right here as a reference. As far as this form factor goes, this is a relatively large mini PC, but I think the fact that you can orient it vertically with the stand here does make it have a smaller footprint. I would say in terms of just overall size here, it is comparable to something like the Xbox Series S. 
Now the Series S is skinnier and taller, but as you can see, they're just about the same amount of size. And so it feels like to me that the NAD9 is about the same size as a console. And so if you wanted to set this up in your living room as a dedicated movie server or a light gaming PC, you could definitely do that here, and I think the size is about appropriate. But as far as mini PCs go, it is relatively large. For example, here is the HX99G. This is a new one. It's also coming out here pretty soon. But the difference between this one and the other is that the HX99G actually has a dedicated graphics card inside. And so despite having about the same amount of size between the two here, the HX99G is much more powerful just by virtue of having that graphics card. Now that being said, I actually like the design on the NAD9 better. It just has a more boxy feel and I really like the look of the mesh here. For me, the HX99G 99G is a cross between like a modem and a gaming PC, and for me it just doesn't really resonate. And so if we're only going to go by looks alone, I think the one on the left looks better. But as my mother always said, it's what's inside that counts, and so let's take a look at the software of the NAD9 next. First let's go into the about section here just to confirm that yes, this is the chip we were expecting with 16 gigs of RAM, and it is running Windows 11 Pro. Now one of the first things I like to do when testing a mini PC is to run a CPU benchmark at the same time as I'm monitoring the temperatures. And you can see here under a 100% load we're getting an average of about 65 degrees Celsius on all of the cores. And this is running at a stock 45 watt TDP for this APU. Now if you look closely at the temperatures here you can see that the max readings for some of these is relatively high. In fact one of them even got up to 90 degrees Celsius. However, as I was watching the benchmark unfold, these higher temperatures here were just like a quick millisecond blip. And so honestly, I don't think that the CPU actually got that hot there in an instant. I think what really happened here is we got a bad read. As it stands during the 10 minute benchmark test here at 100% load, the average temperature stayed at around 65 up to maybe 67 degrees altogether. And so despite having that max temperature spike right there, I don't actually think this is bad at cooling. In fact, I think it's actually rather good at it. And in addition to keeping the temperatures very low here, it actually remained completely silent. Here's a quick sound test right here at maximum volume here with the fan. And chances are you're not actually hearing anything, and that's because I never actually heard the fan when it was in use. In fact, this is probably one of the most silent mini PCs I've ever tested. As an example, the breeze blowing outside my window in the back here in this room was louder than the fan itself. And here's a quick look at the end of the benchmark here. As you can see, it got a little bit less than 11,000 on Cinebench. And to me, those numbers are pretty good, but I always like to test real world use cases more than actual numbers. And so the next thing I usually will do is I'll test it for 4K video playback. For me, this is a good indicator whether or not it's going to be a good media server, and as you can see here, even running through multiple thousands of frames, we only drop three altogether. And again, I'm not going to focus too much on the numbers here, but I will say that those numbers are the lowest I've ever seen for a mini PC without a dedicated graphics card. And so I think if you were looking for something to use as a media server or for high resolution video playback, this is going to do it no problem. Now when I get a good feeling about the video playback capability of a device, the next thing I often like to test is whether or not it's going to be good when it comes to video editing as well. And so generally what I'll do here is I'll open up one of my older videos in DaVinci Resolve and then I'm going to cut it up and move it around and shrink it down to one minute. Additionally, I like to add things like transitions and text so that way it really taxes that CPU process. From there, I'm going to take that one minute of footage and I'm going to export it into a 1080p 60 frames per second video. And usually what I'm looking for here is I want the video to encode in less time than it takes for the actual runtime of the video itself. And as you can see here, it rendered in 33 seconds, so it did it absolutely no problem. And so to me, that's an indication this PC is going to be great when it comes to photo editing and video editing and even music production as well. But I still wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted to do a little bit more testing. And so after that, what I ran is PC Mark 10. Now this is an older benchmarking software. It's been around forever, but this is my first time actually using it myself. And this is kind of interesting. What it does is it runs the computer through a variety of different use cases, things like video conferencing or running spreadsheets and even browsing the web and editing some photos. And it kind of runs it through that simulated process. And then after it runs through this test, which takes about 20, 25 minutes, it'll give you a score at the end. And as you can see here, I got a score of 5,510. Now, according to 3D Mark's website, this score is about a middle ground between a higher end gaming PC from a few years ago and then also an office laptop from the same period. And so the expectation here is that yes, it's going to run better than a laptop that will usually have integrated graphics as well, but it's still going to lag quite a bit behind a PC with a dedicated graphics card like this. 
Either way, I think that all these tests were a good indication to me that for non-gaming tasks, this thing is going to work out just fine. And so next up, I went ahead and installed the latest graphics drivers from the Intel website, and then I just started gaming. And I always test my PC games in the same way. I start out with the easiest to run games, and then I work my way up until I find some sort of bottleneck. Generally, what I like to do is test everything in 1080p, and then I'll adjust the settings from there. And as expected, the lightweight games, things like Sonic Mania or Icy or Ori and the Will of the Wisps, each of these play at their default settings at 1080p, and absolutely no problem here. However, there are many cheaper mini PCs out there that can run these same type of games as well, and so let's keep pushing and see what else we can find. Moving up next is what I like to call the Xbox 360 or Xbox One era. This is basically going to be games from about five-ish years ago, and I'm going to run these also at 1080p and usually at the default settings. And so the games that I would expect to play at this tier, things like Halo the Master Chief Collection or Grand Theft Auto V, even Bioshock Infinite and Street Fighter V, each of these games played really well at a 1080p resolution with medium to high settings. Now moving on to the next tier, which is what I like to call like former AAA titles here, we did get some mixed results. For example, with Resident Evil 3 at 1080p, we could get a good frame rate, but I had to turn on FSR. But as you can see, even with the FSR quality setting on, the game still looks really good, and I would definitely play it this way myself. Moving over to Rise of the Tomb Raider, this one I also played at 1080p on low settings, and as you can see here, it's getting an average of about 40 frames per second. And so at this point, you'd probably want to reduce this to a 30 or 40 frames per second cap, or you'd have to drop it down to a 720p resolution. Either way, I would still consider this one to be playable, and I think it still looks pretty good. Now, I did find that other games at this same kind of tier here, like Doom Eternal, did not play well. Well. In fact, even at 720p in low settings, I couldn't get a stable 60 frames per second. And so to me, this is a good indication that this is about the limit of PC gaming right here. It can play some former AAA titles, but not all of them. And if you look at some of the more modern AAA titles, something like Marvel Spider-Man, you can see right here that it's struggling to keep at 30 frames per second at 1080p on very low settings. Now, if I do drop it down to 720p with very low settings, we do get a more consistent frame rate. But personally, I found that the graphics here at 720p with the FSR cranked all the way, it just did not look very good. And so honestly, I don't think I would play Spider-Man on this machine. And then same thing here with God of War. I cranked up the FSR as much as I could and then also kept it on low settings, but even then it looked really bad. And so yes, I would say that this can play former AAA titles pretty well, but when it comes to modern AAA titles, the lack of the GPU right here is just not going to cut it. And so that's where we are when it comes to PC games. Now let's move over to emulation and see what kind of performance we can expect there. Now I'm not really going to test the lower end systems here because those are all going to play just fine. So we're going to work on GameCube and above. Additionally, for all these systems, my target goal here was a 1080p resolution, so 3x resolution here with GameCube. And as you can see here, a 1080p upscale with GameCube actually runs like a champ, and so even games like F-Zero GX are going to play at full speed. Now, given the fact that we're talking about a $720 mini PC, I would fully expect these all to play at 1080p, and so let's move on and see where we can really push it. And so next up here is PlayStation 2. This one's always a little bit harder to run than GameCube, but not by much. But even then, you can see that I was able to set it to a 1080p resolution and then just play all of the games with absolutely no problem. And that even includes some of the heavier hitting games like Black and God of War 2. And so if you are looking for a machine that can play PS2 without having to mess around with the settings internally, this might work out pretty well. However, when it comes to mini PCs, there are many of them that can play at this same level for a much lower price point, and so let's keep pushing from here. Okay, up next we have the Nintendo Wii U running with the CMU emulator. Now this one is running at the native resolution of the system itself, which is between 720p and 1080p depending on the game. However, as you can see here, all these games are running really well. In fact, some of them are actually caching these shaders at the same time that I'm filming this footage, and so there will be a little bit of hiccup here and there, but otherwise these games are going to play at full speed. And so after the shaders cache, which usually happens in the first 5-10 minutes of any gameplay, you should be right as rain after that, and so I would say this is definitely capable of most Wii U games. The only game that I actually got less than 60 frames per second with was Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And for this one I'm running it at the native 720p of the game itself, and as you can see it's hovering between like 40 and 50 frames per second. And so personally what I would do here is I would go into these settings under the graphics pack and then change it to a 40 frames per second cap. And that means you'll get some more consistent frame rates as you're playing the game. 
and I also decided to play here near the castle because this is one of the hardest places to emulate. And so as you can see here, if it's going to get this kind of frame rate at this point in the game, that means you can reliably play this at a 40 frames per second, no problem here. Okay, and so next up here, let's try Nintendo 3DS. This is running the Canary version of Citra. And for the most part, these games are going to run at a 3x resolution, which is very close to 1080p. And so I would say here, the performance is pretty impressive, and I would expect to get between 2 and 3x resolution for most games. There were only a couple that I had to actually drop it down to a 2x resolution, and that included Super Mario 3D Land. This one always seems to be one of the harder games to emulate, and so as you can see here, the frame rate is just kind of going all over the place. But if you actually look at the gameplay footage itself, it was a relatively smooth experience. I would definitely be comfortable playing this at a 2x resolution. Now, the emulation performance here wasn't quite perfect. For example, when playing the original Xbox, I was a little bit disappointed in what I saw. Even when playing most games at a 1x or native resolution here, you can see that the slowdown here is pretty significant. Even some of the more reliable games, like Panzer Dragoon Orta, which I've always seen playing at a full frame rate doesn't actually play at full speed here. And so I'm not sure what's going on here with the Intel integrated graphics in the Xbox emulator, but they are not playing well. And so this is not a very good Xbox emulator right here. And unfortunately, it was even worse on the Xbox 360 emulator. No matter what game I played, I struggled to get even 10 frames per second. And so among all of the many systems that I tested here today, this is the one I would consider to be the most unplayable. And so if you are looking for a mini PC in particular to emulate Xbox or Xbox 360 games, I would say this is not going to be a good choice for you. Now, another system I was really interested in testing was PlayStation 3. This is one that always heavily favors lots of cores and threads. And then given the fact that this chip has a total of 14 cores inside, I figured this would be a no brainer. And yes, I found that for many PS3 games, they were playing really well on this device. And so games like Dead or Alive 5 or Dead Souls or even Ridge Racer 7, other than a little bit of caching of the shaders right in the beginning, these were playing flawlessly. However, unfortunately, I would not say that this computer was especially good at PS3 emulation. And that's not necessarily because of the performance of these three games here, but the performance of the other games that I tested. I found that for some games like Top Spin 4, it never actually rendered the graphics correctly, and so this game was basically unplayable. But the other disappointing thing I found is that many of the games that I would test as basically standard PS3 titles would actually crash while in game. And so games like Prince of Persia, Ratchet and Clank, and even Mirror's Edge were unplayable because after a few minutes the game would just crash. And maybe it's because I've been recently spoiled with a bunch of different AMD chips to test, and so I wasn't expecting this kind of performance here. And so sadly, even though PS3 performance is very good when it actually works, there were many times when it didn't. And so, much like with Xbox, I would say if you specifically want to play PS3 games on this machine, you may be disappointed. Now, thankfully, the one silver lining here is that Nintendo Switch emulation using the Yuzu emulator was actually very good. Even when setting this up in docked mode, I could play almost every single game at full speed. And so when it comes to emulating the Nintendo Switch using a PC that doesn't have a dedicated graphics card, this is some of the best I've seen. And so it's been kind of a roller coaster of emotions when it comes to high-end emulation. Xbox, Xbox 360, and PS3 leave a lot to be desired, but all the Nintendo systems, all the way up to Nintendo Switch, work really well. And so really, I think it's all going to come down to what specific systems you're most interested in. If it's going to be Nintendo systems, you'll have a great time. However, when it comes to Microsoft and Sony, the results are fairly mixed. Okay, so wrapping all this together, including the benchmark and the testing, let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Minis Forum N89. To start, I think the mini PC has a nice design. I like that it's kind of boxy in shape and it just looks like a small PC tower. I also like the ventilation on each side. It just makes it have an open air kind of appearance. I'm a little bit concerned about the amount of dust that's gonna get onto the motherboard over time, but an air duster can fix that no problem. I also appreciate that it has a good variety of the front I.O. I love having both USB-A ports for controllers as well as USB-C ports if I need to plug in a solid state drive or something like that. I also really like the fact that I basically never heard the fan the entire time I was testing it, even at a 100% load. And so when it comes to a smallish PC that doesn't take up a lot of attention because it doesn't make any noise, this is a great fit. And I do think the NAD9 is a good fit as well for everyday PC tasks. As we saw in the variety of tests I did earlier in the video here, it was a champ in basically every realm. Now, of course, I wouldn't use this for like 4K or 8K video editing, but when it comes down to 1080p video editing like what I do, it worked perfectly fine. I also found that the device worked really well for most emulation. There were specific systems that had problems, but everything else ran well. And so along those same lines, let's talk about some of the things that disappointed me about the N89. 
Number one, as we saw, the Xbox and PS3 emulation performance left a lot to be desired. One of the main reasons that I agreed to test this PC is because I wanted to see what 14 cores were going to be like when it came to PS3 emulation. And so you can imagine I was pretty disappointed to find that half the games I booted didn't actually play at all. And honestly, I think this all really comes down to the integrated graphics that are available from Intel. After spending the past several months testing many others that came from AMD, I feel like it's a night and day difference between the two, at least right now. And so unfortunately, I would say that it's definitely the integrated graphics that is holding this back from being as good of a performer when it comes to gaming tasks. I also found that the NAD9 was a little bit large for a mini PC. After all, there are other models from Mini's forum that are smaller than this one and perform better. And like I mentioned in the teardown, I do suspect that this design is going to be used for other models in the future, specifically with a dedicated graphics card. And so that does make sense if they're going to use this as an entry point into a larger product line in the future. But as it stands on its own, it is a relatively large mini PC. Now, of course, there are some benefits of having that larger size, for example, the excellent cooling and the fact that you don't don't really hear the fan. And so there is a trade off there, but if desk space is a premium, this one might be a little bit big for your tastes. And finally, my last point here is I felt like this mini PC was priced a little bit higher than I was expecting. After all, the last Mini's Forum PC that I tested, the UM690, comes out at $650 and outperforms this in just about every way. In fact, if you look at my Mini PC spreadsheet, which I'll have linked in the video description, you can see that the performance here just doesn't really add up to the price when compared to other models, even from the same company. And so I'm not really sure what's going on here in terms of pricing, but $710 for me is just a little bit higher when it comes to the performance that we were getting. Now, this may very well be just an after effect of the fact that Intel chip are quite expensive compared to AMD chips, but all the same, this is a lot of price for not as much performance. And so in the end, do I recommend the NAD9 for consideration? And as always, it's going to come down to you and your use case, but I did find that with this mini PC in particular, it was hard to find a use case that fit. I think in the end, if you're looking for a desktop PC either to be used as a media server or for everyday PC tasks, and you want something that's very quiet and has good ventilation, then yeah, I think this might work. Additionally, the fact that you can set it up vertically does remove some of that footprint from being a larger mini PC. And so I think in that particular context, yes, the NAD9 might be a good choice. However, if you're specifically looking for higher end PC gaming and emulation, then I don't think this is going to be a good fit. Instead, if you're looking for a smaller form factor mini PC, I would recommend checking out the UM690, which I reviewed about a month ago, and I'll leave a link to that in my video description. Or if you want something with a dedicated graphics card, I would recommend considering the Neptune series from Mini's Forum as well. And as I mentioned, I do have the HX99G in hand, and that'll be the next mini PC I review. And so in the end, when it comes to the NAD9, I think there are other models that give you a better price to performance. You can either get something that's smaller and cheaper, or you can get something that's more performant for a little bit more. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is there a use case for the NAD9 that I didn't quite catch here in the video? Or do you think there are better alternatives out there for this price? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.